All right, so breaking news. Breaking news. This this is possibly our first food heist update. Ooh. Remember a couple episodes ago we yeah. talked about someone stealing tomatoes in India? Yes. That has become a nationwide plague of tomato thefts in India. There's a tomato theft all across the country. There's a tomato theft mafia. There must be. Obviously, a red market. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. So um, tomatoes. uh, Someone stole the the, this this particular story is 400 kilograms of Mm -hmm. tomatoes stolen from a farmer's van. Uh, He had hid it under mesh. And they stole it. Wow. Eve, camouflage? He camouflaged his yeah. tomatoes because everyone is stealing the tomatoes. The thing is, right now, tomatoes are wildly difficult to get in India. Okay. Uh, they are priced at 150 rupees per kilogram. And I did all the math. Mm-hmm. That comes out to about a buck 83 in US dollars right now. And that's about what you can buy tomatoes for here in Utah. Right. The difference is the cost of living there is a little less than half of what it is here. Yeah. So tomatoes are twice as expensive for them as they are for us. And they get used in so many Indian dishes. They're incredibly common. They're one of the staple foods. And they're just super scarce for whatever reason. And all across uh, the country. So this was in um, Shirur. Mm-hmm. Um they, there's reports in Mumbai, in Madhya Pradesh, Bengaluru, Jaipur, all of these cities, tomatoes are being stolen hand over fist. So last time I postulated that this was time travelers. Time travelers trying to like, yeah, yeah or some big galactic yeah. tomato entity. I might be wrong. If it's this much, it might be something different. Yeah. It's probably not time travelers from the future. It's time travelers from the past. You Ooh. see, okay. the tomato is, is, okay. a, is, is a North American uh, fruit. It is. Right? And I postulate that the initial cultivators of the tomato, after you know obtaining time travel, which they did way back which then. Which they clearly, yeah, clearly did. did. They came forward and found that the dem- tomato had stopped Spread being Spread all over the world. To them, this is a bunch of pissed off Aztec priests yep. who are like, "No, tomato is you ours. You can't have our stuff." I mean, those Aztec priests, not the nicest people in the world, right? This um, is Aztec gods having a petty fight with yes, Hindu that, gods. Huitzilopochtli is <laughs> Huitzilopochtli. Su- yes, <laughs> he, 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 he's cons- he, 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 Did you he, call him Wheat Chipotle? I pronounced it the way that the scholar that I that spoke Nahuatl pronounced oh. it. Did you? Yes. Okay. Which Lapotzle is what, but my Oops. best okay. best pronunciation of it, you're probably speaking Mexican version. I am. Rather Which than being is Nahuatl. the Mexican yes. way of I pronounced it the way that the scholar, that my best attempt okay. at, at imitating. I believe you. Which Lapotzle, I think he said Lee. Um, um, but okay. regardless, the left-handed hummingbird or mm-hmm. whatever, the Aztec, uh, one of the main Aztec gods, he's... That's Quetzalcoatl. Uh, well, he... Oh, but, yeah. Quetzalcoatl is the one that led them to, right? He's the one that no, led them... No, that's Quetzalcoatl that led them to Tenochtitlan. Huitzilopochtli is the god of war. He's the one that required the sacrifices. Yes. He's the one with the temples and mm-hmm. things. Okay, so, yeah. so Quetzalcoatl led them, and the hummingbird, but he's not a hummingbird. He's named after the hummingbird, uh, is the one that demanded the sacrifices. Yeah. Okay, so he... Me, me, he's just me got a nasty guy. bone to pick with yeah. like Kali or something. Yeah. He's like, we cannot let this stand. We need to go forward in time and steal all the tomatoes back. Then they won't be able to grow any more tomatoes. Okay. And they will have to come to us. I love it. Yep. I yep. love it. Uh, I love how all our food heists turn into bad story ideas. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's point out that the scholar I listened to, I listened to a book about mm-hmm. it, uh, might be pronouncing it wrong. Possibly. It does happen. I'm probably, I'm guaranteed to be pronouncing them wrong. Well, you're probably pronouncing it right in but the again, language that the, you learned it yeah. from, right? Uh, let's like, also say, while we're, while we're saying really fun Aztec mm-hmm. names, uh, the big volcano, Popocatépetl. Yes. Um, there's a Faye song. She was a singer who was big in the 90s called Popocatépetl, and it has this big section in the middle where she talks really fast. Mm-hmm. I can do the entire thing. I'm very proud of it. 
I'm I keep waiting for that to show up on a karaoke list so I can do karaoke of Faye's Popocatépetl, but all they have is a Sucaramago. I'm legitimately impressed. Yeah, I I actually am. Well, um, one day as like bonus content. All right, all right. <laughs> so Aztec God stealing tomatoes. No, one of our stealing next tomatoes. crossover bad story ideas uh, and food heists. I love that idea because people have often written like Rick Riordan, like yeah. his whole career is. You know, let's take mythology and see what they're doing in the modern day. And we've come up with the dumbest, pettiest thing for them to be doing in the modern day. And I love it. Scar, did you get our second uh, brackets ready? I'm looking at it right now. Okay. Are we going to it? Yeah, do you, do you got them for me? Food heist. Do you want to just look at it? I would love to look at it. I would love to look at it. This is round two because we, we finished the round one. We finished round one. Most of the votes are in. Yes. We don't have quite all of them yet, but that's why we had to wait a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's why you haven't had it the last few weeks. But it is time. Time for the next vote round. All right. So we have sitting at, um, let's see, we we cannot do the very first seed yet. Okay. Because of that. So what we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to go from the bottom up this time. Okay. Sounds good. Does that sound good? good? Makes sense to me. Bottom up. What's Octavia that? Octavia put these together, by the way. And okay. Them to me. So. Well, this is this is how you're supposed to do it with the seed. She did a good job. So, um, so we have the Edelstahlkugel. The Edelstahlkugel versus the Gnocchi Brothers. Nice. Our number two seed versus our the number two seven seed. ones to say out loud. Yes. This the, is going to be such a hard choice. Will the Gnocchi Brothers, Gnocchi Brothers, Gnocchi Restaurant? Beat the Edelstahlkugel? Beat the Edelstahlkugel. Oh, man. Or not. I don't even know how I would vote in this one. Yeah. Because I love them both. I might lean towards the Edelstahlkugel because of how cool it is. Mm. But I just remember the guy who was so worried about the poor little gnocchis, and my heart breaks for him. So, with bad story ideas, we have Weekend at Vader's, number seven seed, Versus the Great British Fake Off, our number two seed. Nice. So the question is, do people do people want um, a T-shirt based on the Great British Fake Off, um, or would they rather have, you know, Weekend at Vader's? Where I think our story that mm-hmm. of the podcast was more fun with Weekend at Vader's, but I think the Great British Fake Off is just a way better actual story it's, it's, idea. Yeah, that's so. I, in this one. I know exactly which one I would vote for. Yeah. But. So number two seed versus seven seed there. Okay. So, so so those are the brackets to vote on this week. Those are your brackets. Use your power wisely. Yes, please participate. And round two, we are at our uh, our s- sweet. No, <laughs> what is this? Is start the eight? The sweet sixteen, then it goes now to eight. What's to the eight, eight? Right. Final four is the, easy. The sweet great 16. eight. What do they call the eight? We're too out of touch with sports to know what you call it when there's eight. No one in the room knows what the eight is? Quarterfinals? Oh, but that's boring. You can't just call them quarterfinals. They, they have Sweet 16 and Final Four. There's got to be there's something in between. There's got to be something in the middle. The, maybe no one. Is, is it not the great eight? Elite eight. Elite eight. Elite I knew eight? that. Elite eight? Yeah, because yeah, they, they that's all. That's dumb. No, they all have to be, they all have to alliterate. Sweet 16 and Final Four. So that's to start so with So they have e. to say Elite Eight? Yeah. They can't mm. say the Awesome Eight? Uh, does Awesome start with E? No, but it starts with this. It, it, it's alliteration is about the sound, not the letter. Not when you're printing them on a... Eight? Uh, not when you're printing on a whole bunch of banners. Okay, how about the Excellent Eight? Okay. I think Elite Eight is totally fine. I think it has one too many syllables. An Excellent doesn't? Excellent can because they're different <laughs> syllables. Elite and eight are the same word, except one of them has a Lee in it. And that bothers me a lot. They should call it the Elite Elate. What are we talking about today, Dan? <laughs> well, last time we talked about the greatest living fantasy authors, and we promised that we would talk about the greatest dead fantasy authors. And so we're going to talk about that. We don't have, uh, like top five lists like we did before no. we're just gonna ramble and part of the it's reason it's so hard for us usually we're so prepared yeah. and i think that coming up with stuff off the cuff that we didn't plan on is going to be so difficult but 
part of the reason for this is um, you're aware of how much I've whined on my um, live stream about not getting free stuff from Wizard of the Coast. Yeah. Being a, uh, a <laughs> Being very poor young man. a ridiculously wealthy guy <laughs> who has more magic cards than most people have cells in their body. Good metaphor. Nice. Yeah. Way, way, to, way to pull that one off See, the See, th this is, this is the problem with rambling. They, uh, they finally sent me something. They sent you they something, sent me something, and it's because they just came out with the Lord of the Rings cards. They came out with the Lord of the Rings cards. They finally sent us something. We did a podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago about Wizards of the Coast. That would have mm -hmm. been a great thing to have. I know. But this arrived this, this arri week. Yeah. So, so I have not opened it. I'm going to open it, and we're going to talk. Because it's about Lord of the Rings, we can talk about Tolkien. Yay! Yeah. Okay. Have we talked about Tolkien before on the podcast, Scar? I mean, I'm sure we've mentioned I'm sure we've talked I don't about know if we've both. done an episode on him. Ooh. Ooh. I don't know if that's supposed to be right in front of your mic. Ooh. No, it's, ooh. Oh, that's a lot of stuff. Yeah, I got a lot of stuff. Man, I uh -oh. need to start whining. I screwed up my mic, Adam. You have to do a hey, sound test. Hey, send me a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Anyone. <laughs> you could be Riot. Like, yeah. Give me a oh, bunch of free yeah. skins for League of Legends. That's what I want. Hey, uh, Ferrari Corporation. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Hostess. <laughs> Hostess. I would eat ding dongs for every meal if you sent them to me for free. I would do it on camera. <laughs> okay, you and I. Here's have... Dan ruining his life because of his love of ding dongs. It's turning into a mukbang. Yeah, this would yeah. be yeah a mukbang. mukbang it's podcast. actually mok, uh, but we say it in English mok. Yeah, um, but it's mok mukbang. I would say this is the day that Dan's depression hit the eating ding dongs live on Twitch phase. You uh, you definitely pick different uh, different. <laughs> My mind went to Ferrari. Uh, yours did not. Um, no. Yours went to... Because I know I would enjoy a ding-dong more than a car. <laughs> like, I'm not a car person. Look, have you not seen that episode of The Simpsons where Homer loses a $20 bill, or peanuts? He loses his last peanut under his chair. He okay. reaches under there for a peanut that he lost, and he comes mm -hmm. out with a $20 bill. And he says, oh, I wanted a peanut. And then... His brain, his says, brain says, money can be exchanged for goods and services. If yeah. you had a Ferrari, I bet you had. It would not take much to figure out how. So to... what you're saying is that I should wish for a Ferrari so that I can trade it in for a Ferrari's monetary value worth of ding dongs. I think you could probably rent that Ferrari and get ding dongs more than you could eat, I put and the still Ferrari have a Ferrari up on Tubi or something, yes. and not mm -hmm. Tubi. What's the Tuvo? Yes, the little... Tuvo your Ferrari. Yeah. One or two weekends, and you have as many ding dongs. Do, like, mm. do they have a setting where instead of putting a price in dollars, you can put it in ding dongs? <laughs> like you could drive my Ferrari for twenty ding dongs a day. That's I, wildly I, undervaluing my Ferrari. I I I am not gonna go there. I'm just <laughs> yeah. Um, well done, Dan. Um, Tolkien. When did Tolkien. what age were you when you read Tolkien? Uh, my dad read The Hobbit to us when we mm -hmm. were little. We're probably seven, eight, nine years old, something like that. Okay. I read The Hobbit for the first time. Um, I was 11. Okay. And I really liked The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. And so I immediately started The Lord of the Rings. And it's very different. Yeah, it was like hitting a brick wall. Yeah. I was not a good reader during that time. This is before I kind of really discovered books. Um, but I did read The Whole Hobbit and enjoy it. What's your kind of perspective on Tolkien? Um, I love Tolkien. Uh, we, after The Hobbit, you know, my dad read us the the Lord of the Rings. Um, I think the first one I read on my own was Silmarillion, and I must have been in junior high by that point. Uh, I do remember doing a project in my English class in eighth grade on mm -hmm. the Lord of the Rings, and she said, did you really read these recently? And I'm like, of course I reread them. But I didn't. I was lying to my teacher. Sorry, Mrs. Andereg. I lied to you. Um, I loved. I loved them. Um, I instantly became a fantasy person, uh, and the the languages in particular. Uh, I I became a kind of armchair linguist, primarily because of how much I loved reading the appendices about Quenya and the way that the elves speak and the dwarf rune language and all this stuff just 
the the language stuff fascinated me even more than the history stuff did. So are you going to put a con lang into your Cosmere? Uh, I, epic yes, fantasy? I actually have a full writing system that I've designed that have looks you? like musical notation, and I'm very excited to use it in the book. Because this so. is this will be your your first epic fantasy, mm-hmm. like that will come out. I know you've I, written I've published some fantasy before, yeah. but it was like tie in fiction for War yeah. Machine and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Uh, this will be the first like original thing, epic fantasy that I have published, and I absolutely want to do a con link for it. First thing in our little box here, it is dice dice with uh, the one ring symbol. Okay, on, so these are it. six-sided dice, and then there's a little one ring symbol here. I can yeah, put it up in front of it's uh thing. it's the the symbol of the set, I believe. So okay, yeah, nice. And why why D6s? Do you use D6s? You do for counters um for oh, how many yeah. you know uh and things like that. Uh so okay. having some D6s is always very handy for playing some magic. We are not sponsored by magic, we are just shills. Yeah. Yes, they just We are shameless fans unpaid. I have warned you. We will not be doing this regularly for other things, but I am an absolute <laughs> shill for Magic the Gathering. Uh so so when they f- send me free stuff. Yeah. I remember uh, one of the defining quotes of how I think of Brandon. Yes. This was maybe 12 years ago. Oh, no, this is going to be bad, isn't some, it? Some friend of ours was trying to convince you to try this new card game that had come out, and you said, no, that's for Dan. Dan plays games. Uh, I yeah. play magic. Yep. And I'm like, oh, that's such so well put. They have. That's the... when I said, you should be a writer and started young Brandon Sanderson's career. When I was 14, somehow. <laughs> um <laughs> They have the the planeswalker symbol done Is all fancy. Is that a planeswalker symbol? Yeah, it's done okay. all fancy Tolkien esque nice. on it. So, so, um, so for me with Tolkien, what happened is I did not read and appreciate Tolkien until I was uh, in my twenties. Really, Lord of the Rings. Okay, um, so you so read Hobbit eleven. Red Hobbit bounced off. Bounced him. off of. Found Lord Terry of the Rings. Brooks in my in my twenties mm-hmm. or my teens, my young teens. Perfect time to discover Sword of Shannara. Yeah. Read so the, the Shannara books, loved them. Read uh, David Eddings after that, mm-hmm. both of which were you, directly inspired. Uh, and then read a whole bunch of Tolkien-esque stuff uh, to the point that by the time uh, I found some non-Tolkien-esque stuff, Tolkien-esque stuff, I was really ready for it, you yeah. know, um, and whatnot. And so my uh, relation to Tolkien, I wrote a, an essay uh, early in my career, that may was maybe ill advised. It had such a clickbaity title. It was like you know how Tolkien ruined fantasy. Yeah. And then if you read the essay, it was Tolkien was so good that fantasy for the next twenty years just, just sat copied him yeah. in awe of him. I wouldn't even say copied. They iterated. Mm-hmm. Like Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever. It's a great series. Um, sort of Shannon. Very different. Great series. Yeah. Uh, all of the um, tie in. You know, stuff mm-hmm. from uh, TSR back then, now Wizards of the Coast, like D&D came from Tolkien. Like, it's actually yeah. really awesome that he did something so defining of a genre that for 20 years we were yeah. trying well, to catch so, up. So many people don't even connect the dots because Tolkien's work, Tolkien's mm-hmm. themes, his images have become so ingrained in our culture the reason Dungeons and Dragons has dungeons in it is yeah. Moria. Yeah. Like 110%. And that's just how people thought fantasy worked because mm-hmm. that's how Tolkien did it. Is Moria and Smaug. Yeah. And you know, you got to got to have dragons. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah. Um so I read Tolkien like really in my 20s for the first time and seriously appreciated it and and things like that. Uh even still there's something about reading Tolkien that that I love and my brain can't cannot really process that we we all let him get away with this because if you read Tolkien <laughs> it reads like uh, Song of Roland in a lot of places yeah. or something like this it reads like Paradise Lost it reads like people giving bold poetic speeches and things mm-hmm. like this that if any of us tried to write we would be laughed out of the editorial <laughs> office uh and yet Tolkien has yeah. just such presence to his writing they're like no 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 
if somebody's going to write like the Bible or, you know, Milton, yeah. it's him. Yeah, he deserves. He did it. He did it. He did it. Um, it works. He he really was like, you know, in the same way that George Lucas, mm -hmm. when he did Star Wars, he was specifically trying to create a new mythology. That yes. was his overt stated goal. Uh, and that's what the, the Tolkien was doing the same thing. He was basically doing Beowulf, but his own Beowulf. Mm -hmm. And it is written like that. It's written like a medieval epic, and it sounds like it, and it has the poetic language. Uh, there's a paragraph in Return of the King when the Witch King breaks down the gate to confront Gandalf in Minas Tirith mm -hmm. that I will go back and reread every few months, every few years, just because it is so beautiful. His language is great. And he's primarily a linguist rather than an author, and it shows. This is amazing. Okay, that's cool. Look how cool that is. It's a giant spin-down 20-sided die that has the Eye of Sauron in half of it. Okay, so here is this die, and then you turn it around, and there, perfectly kind of bisecting the die. That is really neat. Yeah, that's there's a merch idea, something like that. Though That is really cool. Uh, whoever came up with this, uh, Gold Star. You earned your yeah. minimum wage that because, day. Because, you know, some dice with the, the set, set ball on, that's low-hanging fruit. We totally mm -hmm. want it, but this. The Eye of Sauron. The Eye of Sauron. A 20-sided yeah. die. Yeah. Okay. So, so who are some of those other uh, authors that have passed okay, away so, since? That, uh, uh, the, the, after I discovered Tolkien, uh -huh. the next one for me was Anne McCaffrey. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not entirely true. In fifth grade, I, I started reading some Robin McKinley. I started okay. reading some Jane Yolen. Yeah. Uh, but it was Anne McCaffrey in sixth grade. I had an incredibly wonderful sixth grade teacher who assigned us to read um, the Dragon Song. Okay. Uh, and, oh, cool. You know, yeah. uh, and do projects on that. Mm -hmm. And I immediately read, you know, that whole trilogy and then the Dragon Rider trilogy and all the other Pern stuff. And this was back when she was still putting out Pern stuff. So every year or so, there'd be a new one in the library that got more and more science fictional and funky as time went on. Um, she was like my first fandom, I guess you could say, uh, other than Star Wars, was Anne McCaffrey. I, um, I, Anne, I've told this story many times. She was my second fantasy author, mm -hmm. not counting... The dabblings, like I did read some Jane Yellen. I didn't, it was before I knew fantasy was a genre mm -hmm. and I like became a fantasy reader. Yeah. Uh, so Dragon's Blood by, uh, by her is actually my first fantasy book. Okay. Uh, but really like I, I, I talk about the kind of start of a fantasy writer. It was Dragon's Bane by uh, um, Barbara Hamley. Yeah. And then the next one was Dragonflight. So I started right into the- uh, So you started the Dragon Rider one yes. before the kind of YA one? I don't think the YA one was out yet. Oh, okay. Um, I maybe could be wrong. Maybe, it, when, when was Dragon Song? Um, it probably was. Um, yeah. Because they, it, they was, were second. As I, would, I remember yeah. being able to immediately read yeah. Dragon Singer and No, you've got to be right. Dragon it's drums. probably the first, the, the three. Uh, so it's probably Dragonflight, uh, White Dragon, and Dragon Quest. And then it was probably... Dragon Singer, Dragon Song, Dragon Drum, and Dragon Flight was like sixty nine when yeah. she like won the Hugo for uh, mm -hmm. that. So Dragon Song was seventy six. Seventy six. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's that. So they were out. Um, mm -hmm. So I the I started on those. I also remember new ones coming out though. So yeah. Uh, so he, did you read them in order? I because read it them, was Dragon yeah. Flight, Dragon something else, Dragon Quest, Dragon Quest, and then before White Dragon, she did the. Dragon Song, Dragon Singer, oh, really? Dragon Drums, and then White Dragon. And that's like so, the chronological order. They didn't have the 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 YA ones okay. in my school library. Oh, interesting. So I read the trilogy. And, I, and this was high school, right? High school, yeah. yeah. And so uh, I then got those from whatever. And so Anne McCaffrey was my second author ever, my first series that I ever read. Mm -hmm. So yeah, deeply, deeply. People, like I have been hesitant to write the Cosmere Dragon Rider series 
because it is so deeply influenced by Anne McCaffrey. I'm like, yeah. is there a way that I can make this that doesn't feel just like an Anne McCaffrey knockoff? There's a to- to- whole world and a to- whole series that I've yeah. just never written because I'm like, I- and, and it's so hard. Uh, yeah. Like I, I talked last week about uh, Priory of the Orange Tree, mm-hmm. uh, and there's like they talk at one point about how the the rise and fall of the dragons is influenced by this comet that comes and you know some of the comet's energy comes to the planet yep. and i'm like oh Anne McCaffrey yep like she is so foundational to every dragon story it's like ever made she is how i think of like there's two modes for dragons in my head there is the kind of mythological dragon as ancient god that can become human and things mm-hmm. like that which D popularized but it's kind of this whole eastern mythology dragon yeah those are in the cosmere we've met a few of those mm-hmm. but there's also this how the dragons talk and think uh bonded to a person dragon rider thing uh and i've never i haven't done those yet yeah um and that's just it's so Anne mccaffrey i don't know if i could separate from it it would be so hard yeah, but uh, maybe I would love maybe you to just do. Maybe you just don't. Maybe you just like you know what this just is. Embrace it. This is. Say, you this know what? Is, I grew up on Anne McCaffrey and Dragonlance. Yeah. You just this. That's what you get. This is what you get. Yeah. Um, and it's not just you know because Melanie Ron, one of my early big influences, mm-hmm. her dragons are very Anne McCaffrey dragons also. Yeah. Um, and you know another Michael Whalen uh, cover artist there. Um, and really, really loved. Um. Love those books, the Sunrunner books. Did you ever read those? No. Uh, they're great. Uh, I've picked up and read them. And then, you know, it's been a decade or so, but still really liked them. Hmm. Uh, influenced cool. how I do magic quite a bit. If I'm going to point out where my magic systems come from, Melanie Ron was a big... Melanie uh, Ron. A big, That's cool. And she, she had this weird story where she started a new series and then had a bad breakup with her publisher and editor. And never finished it. Oh, that's too bad. And I hate it when that happens. Yeah. And so you got two or one book in a series and not the rest of them. And uh Is that Sunrunner? No. Sunrunner she finished. Okay. Um and uh, a sequel series to Sunrunner she finished. And then this is a new world. Um and really cool world, really interesting, but still to this day, as I as as far as I know, not finished. Mm-hmm. Um and she went and moved to writing urban fantasy and romance after that. Okay. So. Well, that's cool. So here we got, we got, we got. Okay, these sleeves. Sauron sleeves. Card sleeves. So one of the things that's nice about the set, uh, I really like their Lord of the Rings set. This is not just me gushing to get more free stuff. <laughs> um, I have like one minor criticism and okay. a lot of major criticisms. One difficult thing they had to do is they didn't want it to be the movie, right? Yeah. So they had to come up with an iconic representation of Sauron that wasn't the cool armor um, that's there. And this is their representation. I really like their Sauron. He has this like hat with like a flaming thing on. Uh, yeah. yeah it covers his eyes. Yep. It looks he, very Phyrexian to me, yeah, actually. He, he, he looks, yeah. Uh, so I, I like their designs mm-hmm. of a lot of their things. Here, uh, mm-hmm. I have up in my office, yep. uh, I, have, I, I was able to find through a friend, um, the full set of the four commander decks oh. for Lord of the Rings. Okay. And so I looked through those very quickly today, and one of my main comments was- You mean like this, that exactly, they just sent me? That was the first one I opened, yeah, well, is that the cards have so much text on them. That's magic these days. Is that days. just magic these that's days? That's just magic these days, Because yep. it didn't used to be like that. No, nope. uh, they, they have found that um, there's, there's a couple factors in this. One is- Digital becoming a major force in all card games means that most of the card text doesn't matter in digital because okay. it does it all for you. Mm-hmm. So they found there's certain things can be very long, but in a in a digital format, it it's it's very yeah. simple. Uh, and the other thing is they found that uh, people really like um, they like the the long card text. Those cards really? sell better. Those That's those wild. particularly like for commanders and stuff. Uh, do better. And the other thing about magic is a lot of this text could be written shorter, but they need to be very precise with their rules language. Mm-hmm. And so it gets longer because yeah. it has to mean all of this. Stuff. It gets, it turns into legalese basically mm-hmm. so that if you yeah, know it, like you can read it. Reading a contract. Yeah. Uh, my, my concern, cause one of the yeah. decks, like the Elven deck that has mm-hmm. Gandalf and 
uh, Galadriel and mm-hmm. Celeborn and all these people. It, I, that's not a deck I can take and give to my 11-year-old and he will know how to play it because everyone has just so much stuff on them. Um, hey, and Commander is going to be extra. That, But yeah. if they ever want to play Commander, they have to learn all this stuff mm-hmm. because Commander yeah. is a... I am going to take these decks home and play with my kids. So yeah, tonight or tomorrow. So we, I got uh, I got a uh, commander deck. Uh, I got the uh, I got the Riders of Rohan, which actually has the um, one of the strongest cards I believe in this commit is in here. Oh, it's which going one? in cubes. It's called Fourth Aerlingus. Air, Air Fourth Aerlingus. Yes. What yeah. what what is that from the books? I know it's Lord that, Rohan. Uh, the, that... the that's what you shout when you want him to charge. Okay. Why Aerlingus? Like what is that? The Aerlingus. Yes. Uh, are like the the people of Rohan. The okay. Rohirrim. The, the yeah. so Rohirrim is what I call them. That's not their actual name. No, they 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 have many names. Okay. The Aerlingus, if I remember correctly, are specifically the horse riding warriors. Okay. Of Rohan. So okay. everyone who lives in Rohan is the Rohirrim. Okay. Uh, they, but the Aeorlingus are like their mounted warriors. Well, the, there's a card in there called Fourth Aeorlingus. Yeah. Right? That is amazing. And it's going straight in the, the power cube. Straight in the uh, power cube, yeah, huh? So. What does it do? So it is basically a horse fireball. <laughs> right? So it's one white and one red. Mm-hmm. And, and X. And the X that you pay is the number of two two horses, uh, knight creatures with mm-hmm. haste that you get. That's bonkers. Uh, and when it deals damage to an opponent, when a creature, any it's creature, like Firecat Blitz. Yes, that's one of my favorite cards. It also makes you become the monarch, which is a commander thing, which means mm-hmm. you draw an extra card every turn until somebody hits somebody you. Somebody else becomes a monarch. So you can actually cast it just for two without the X. Any creature this turn. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, deals damage you become the monarch which means that you can if you get a head on the board with just a creature no one else has anything you can just cast it for two and start drawing an extra card every turn so that's um, pretty crazy it is a but a horse fire a rohirrim fireball fireball of <laughs> rohirrim uh that is but it it's better because it's they're two twos right mm-hmm. so if you spend You're four mana twice as much power you get, you get four if you spend five you get six yeah, and they're blockable so yeah. it's yeah. kind of fair that's cool yeah i love it it's really good so we might play our game later if we have time but uh and fourth uh aerolingus is the battle cry of duro hero um and um it referred to their first king Aero, um a name meaning the people of the arrow so okay I'm wondering what that means okay the people of aor so Aeoral. here, we also, this is kind of the same. We got a starter kit, which is kind of just two decks you can play against each other. That's cool. Um, that are that are cool because, you know, uh, and I think this actually oh, it has a little mini collector's booster in it, I think. Maybe not. Maybe this isn't the one. But either way, it has a, a card art by Magali, uh, who's done a bunch of our heralds oh, that we just love. She is such love. a good artist. Yeah. Uh, deciphers... Mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings game. She did so many of like the Arwen and the Elrond and stuff. You can stuff, pop that open art. if you want to look. But that They're gorgeous. That might be my favorite piece of art in the whole set. Is, is the Aragorn, Aragorn, Aragorn and Arwen, Arwen wed? Uh, just because I love. I'm gonna Magali. open this so that I can show it properly to the camera. Yeah, uh, she is one of my favorite uh, fantasy art artists. Also, mm. I think I'm gonna try and take pictures of all this stuff just so yeah. people can see it. Maybe, maybe we will do some some pictures. Um, this is the point in the show where someone showed up who was hoping we would talk about like books or something, and they're yeah. like, "Nope, this is just an unboxing video for yeah. magic stuff." I mean, you there know, yeah, you go. You can't see that very well. Um, but while we're uh, let let's talk about books for a minute. Yeah. Um, Robin McKinley. Robin McKinley. One of, one, one of my other kind of foundational yep. mm-hmm. ones. Blue sword, hero in the crown. Yep. Um. Also one that I found, like, I can divide my fantasy reading eras. Mm-hmm. And one era was, what fantasy do they have in my high school library? Right? Okay. Because yeah. I read Dragon's Bane, given to me by my, um, by my teacher. Then I went and found Anne McCaffrey. Read those. They only had three, as I recall. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, what other fantasy is there? And I just went searching. So I'm like, this is a genre. And the next book I found was The Blue Sword. So I read Blue Sword and Here in the Crown. There you um, go. So those came straight out of the the Lincoln East High School Library. 
um, me and Wes Chu, even though I didn't know him yet. Yeah. Um, reading reading That's fantasy what they books. Had. Okay, mm-hmm. so I want to ask you. Yep. Um, because the the next one and and arguably the writer who made me want to become a writer. Uh huh. Uh, was Fred Saberhagen. Okay. I yeah. found him when I was 13. Uh, all these other series were things that my dad read to me or that a teacher recommended. Uh, the first book of Swords yep. by Fred Saberhagen. Uh, that's the one I found myself mm. in the Avenues Library in Salt Lake City and became instantly a fan. I read everything of his. So, did you read Fred Saberhagen? I did, and I thought they were great. Okay. Uh, the book of Swords. So, one of the things is, a lot of these books were going over my head because I was not a good reader mm. at that time. Anne McCaffrey, like her language and stuff going over my head, right? Okay. Um, one of the two early ones I read were Fred Saberhagen and Stephen Donaldson. Ooh. And I remember those two completely just, I'm like, I don't quite get it yet. It's, I love it, but I don't quite get it. Mm-hmm. And like the, the swords books, I remember as a teenager not quite getting the whole Greek gods, like if I recall, yeah. they are from our world in science, a science fiction era, who mm-hmm. have like colonized a world or something like that, and made themselves because they of technology immortal, yeah. and they're doing like the Greek god thing. And I'm like, I guess this is Greek mythology, but something feels off about it. Yeah, that it, it's w- yeah, it's one of those uh, gods exist because people believe in them kind yeah. of magic systems, uh, and it actually is our world after. A thing has happened that turned off normal physics and created magic. Okay. And that is explained in The Empire of the East, which is one of my favorite fantasy novels of all time. It's like Mm -hmm. three novellas that he eventually just squished together into one book. Uh, And that's... I, I, it was written before the Swords books, but it's it's kind of a prequel to the Swords books because they were such bigger hits. Um, But yeah, uh, the, the big main villain of the entire series is Orcus, who is a demon. And he is literally a nuclear explosion uh, that gained sentience when this change happened. Oh, that's cool. Which is such a cool idea. Man, Saberhagen. So fun fact, Harriet McDougall, editor on some of those books. Really? Yes. This is books. Robert Jordan's Harriet. Robert Jordan's Harriet. That's so cool. But Fred Saberhagen, um, uh, Ender's Game, and, mm-hmm. uh, and Wheel of Time, and I think there's some Glenn Cook in there, but I can't remember. I did so. not read uh, mm-hmm. any card. I didn't read Orson Scott Card mm-hmm. or Ender's Game until my senior year of high school. Can't talk about him, though. Still alive. I know. So he's yeah, still alive, still so alive. we can't include him yep. in mm-hmm. our thing. Um, is, no. uh, is Ray Feist still alive? Um, I was on a panel with him about 10 years ago. Uh, I don't know if Raymond Feist is still alive. I bet he is. I assume he is. I haven't heard... Before we totally leave Sab- Saberhagen, I do want to say, um, way back when I was still push- pushing out books with mm-hmm. Tor, uh, I they, they had me write a thing on Tor.com about uh, kind of my influences. Yep. And so it's a huge essay about Saberhagen. So you can still find that online if you want to go look it up. Uh, and if you're curious about the Book of Swords, there's... Um, the basic premise is that the gods got bored and decided to play a game, and they created swords that were the most powerful things in the world and that actually means that they're more powerful than the gods and the swords have incredibly powerful and incredibly specific abilities and he follows these kind of weird logic puzzles as far as he can go yeah they're a little bit asimovian yeah like how the stories play out absolutely like which is really cool um taking you know this idea of oh this is a sword that can do x y or z thing um this is a sword that if you speak someone's name it will find them and kill them whoever they are far slayer yes Yes. that's the one i remember the Um, best far slayer story because he eventually did the books of lost swords Mm -hmm. after he did the you know the the main trilogy far slayer story is uh Starts with like this very Hatfield and McCoy kind of feud Mm -hmm. where two families decimated each other overnight. Okay. Because they got um, far slayer. One guy's like, oh, well, I'm going to kill the guy I hate. And then the sword flies over and kills the guy on the other side of the river. And then they're like, oh, well, I'm going to kill the guy I hate. And the sword flies back and kills the first guy. And then back and forth until there's like a five year old left because he was the only one. Um, following the the rules of how the swords work with computer 
programmer like logic. Uh, I just love Saberhagen. And the little song about the swords, I used to have the whole thing memorized, but I don't anymore. All right. They sent me a bunch of packs. Okay. And this. And you just opened one? I just opened one, and I'm going to give you, we're going to play the Dan tries to guess what a card Ah, does. Ah, we've done this before. We've done this. Denethor. Denethor. What does Denethor do? What does Denethor do? What colors is Denethor? Okay. Denethor is going to be white and black. Nailed it. Yep. Okay. White, black. Okay. The, the yep. colors of fascism. Colors of fascism <laughs> is Denethor. So. Okay. So, yep. and what he does is, oh man, uh, what Denethor does is he listens. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. The does, may, I, I, doubt, I doubt he has a Palantir. That's going to nope. be a different card. This is he is Palantir going is to. No, this is not. This is yeah. This is yeah. Denethor. Yeah. 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 Um, Faramir and Boromir's dad. Does he sacrifice creatures to yes. do something cool? He does. He sends like knights of Gondor to their death in he order to create powerful effects. Sacrifices a creature to make opponents lose life and you gain life. There you go. So, mm-hmm. uh, and he has this cool additional thing that if a creature died under your control that this turn at the end of the turn, he makes a 1-1 soldier that he can then sacrifice. See, that's great. So every turn he can sacrifice a creature and a new one will appear for him to kill. And I want, and every time you sacrifice yeah. a creature to Denethor, you have to say, it is time for this Atog to prove his quality. <laughs> um, they, they they nailed like some of the, like, yeah. Um, so so we'll, we'll open another one here in a minute. Okay. Um, the rare in this one is Pippin, but this is Pippin, Guard of the Citadel. There's multiple oh, Pippins. multiple Pippins. So That's this very one's good. a little harder, I think, for you to guess. I'm curious. Let's see if you can do Guard it. Guard of the Citadel. Guard That's of when the he's Citadel. working for Gondor, right? Working for Gondor. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm going to guess that he has some kind of, like, his main thing he did, in in the movie at least, was he yeah. lit the beacon. He lit so, the beacons. Uh, I'm going to guess that not- this card... Pippin. Helps you summon somebody to he's come help. Not you. the beacon lighter, Pippin. Oh, okay. this is just when he's hanging out. This is just dude who can't yeah. fight a troll, Pippin. Yes. I have no idea. No, he sings a song to Denethor. Yes, that's what he does. He what does gives he do? other preachers you control, like you can target one and give it protection. You got the Mother of Rooms ability. Oh, um, seems weird. Yeah. Well, it's they're trying to come up with a. He can't fight. He can't fight, but he's gonna help. But he can this help other guy. and inspire. So a Nazgul comes to yes. kill Gandalf, and you're like, nope, Pippin. Pippin. Uh, and then he Pippin has steps Ward. steps up and cracks his knuckles, and then Nazgul runs away. Yep. So he's hard okay. He's hard to kill. That's why I was going to make it like harder for you to... That one's hard to guess. That one is a hard one to guess. So, but I we'll, got we'll do Denethor. Some more. You, you nailed Denethor. I Denethor. Let's like not say that... my hand. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll do another one of those in a second, but okay. we're going we're gonna to see. This feels like a play mat. And is it going to be a play mat? I think it's going to be a play mat. And I am always a sucker for a, a nice playmat. So we have... Was that like a leather playmat? This is a leather playmat. They went all out on that. All right. This okay. is a leather playmat. Can I have it? Made with, of olifant leather. <laughs> with Let's the cow. See. Okay. And it is very specifically showing like... Um, Rohan, Isengard, Helm's Deep kind yep. of area. And then, like, this is a commander one because it has your command zone and things like that for you to put your oh, cards man. on. Also, I love the smell of leather. It is one of my favorite smells. In I the do whole not world. have any actual leather play mats. This is by Elder Protectors. They have a little card in it, Leather Game Supplies. So, they, I, uh, I would legitimately wear a cologne called Shoe Store. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love the smell of leather. Here, I'm going to put this up. Yeah. I'll put it in my camera instead of in mm-hmm. Brandon's camera because it's huge. But there you go. Ooh, I've got another pack. Here, I'll put it right so that people in Brandon's camera can't see well. There you go. Uh, this is cool. Um, Adam called it. Does he get it? Well, we'll, we'll see. Um, Do Adam and I have to fight to the death for it? Um, or do you just keep it because they sent it to you? No, we, 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 we should divvy these things up. That should go to a commander player, though. Right? Yeah. Who's building like a, who's a Lord of the Rings cool commander deck. Lord of the Rings I'm commander. keeping the ISR on thing. You I'm absolutely you should because that's, that's my rad as crap. This is, so. this is maybe radder. Yeah. I guess I'm going to start playing commander. 
<laughs> Dare we talk about Good Kind? See, I've never read Terry okay. Good Kind. Okay. okay, I lied. I read the first four chapters or so um, of what eventually became the most expensive coaster on my nightstand. So... He's dead. We can. We He's can dead. We can talk about it. So, um, no, I kind. did not. What was the first book in his series? Wizard's First Rule. Wizard's First Rule. Yeah, I read. Honestly, it was more. I, I gave it six or seven chapters, and I just could not I get into it. I enjoyed Wizard's First Rule well enough, but the second one, which I can't remember what is the name of, is the only book I've ever returned to a bookstore. Really? Yep. Because I got, like, I, I won't return a book that I've read. Mm-hmm. I got a few chapters in, I'm like, why am I reading another of these? And I took it back and got a different book. Okay. It wasn't that I was just, but it wasn't mm-hmm. like I was super offended or something, but I read a few chapters. I'm just like, just, eh, yeah. yeah. Maybe it was the, yeah. Th- maybe it was the third book. Maybe it was the second book I read and I didn't look like, yeah. Cause I remember reading most of the, all of the second book. Um, but you just, this was in my twenties. And during my teens, you just started something. You read the whole thing. Yeah. This one I started. I'm like, oh, the first book was pretty good. I read the second book. And I'm like, this is icky. Yeah, this is. And he was he he wasn't really. I wouldn't call him grimdark. No, he was in the way that grimdark. Martin was. But it was just kind of. I swear it's the second book different. where the the main character woman, um, who's like the the love interest and everything, says, mm-hmm. "All right, well, I'm gonna ride into battle naked because it'll distract them, and then you guys murder them. That's her plan." Um, and I'm like. Uh, I don't think that would work. And then the other two guys that like her, the guy she loves and like the wizard guy are like traveling and like it's her or somebody else. They don't know they're incognito. They get caught. And the, her people are like, we're not supposed to, you know, what if they spill our secrets? She's like, well, I guess you have to murder them. And the whole tension is, oh, will they find out in time that it's the good guys? And I'm like, y- if it'd been two farmers, you just would have murdered them. And that's kind of like, <laughs> don't get me wrong. In a grim, dark book, this can be a moral complication. But these people are presented as the moral, upright Boy Scouts. Yeah. And that's there. And it turns out they don't murder them because they find out there's something. That's, so like that, in the first book, it's just Aragorn and Legolas. And in yeah. the second book, Legolas is like, how about we murder? Murder these random they go people. all murder hobo. There. Yeah. And that's anyway. wild. So, um, okay. So we actually have Scar right here. Yeah. With years decades of military experience is nudity a viable military tactic i don't think so so any soldiers worth their salt have been exposed to more nudity than you care for. <laughs> there you go <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness look a naked lady it's just oh well. they would just be like oh yeah another yeah, one i thought it was stupid too okay so and um i remember it being more distracting and i have overwhelming magical power but it's been a very long time since I've ever you know it might be i'm it's been a very long time for me but i can tell you this um so good kind fandom and wheel of time fandom mm-hmm. had a i felt a good natured sort of you know rivalry yeah right um and good kind kind of stoked the flames for a while with some of the things he said uh which are Kind of interesting, mm-hmm. and he, he uh, never uh, he never allowed anyone to call him a fantasy author. Yes, he it was not a fantasy author. He got better after he got like a few after some time. Okay, he got better. Like one of his last AMAs on Reddit, I went through and I'm like, all right, he's treating people nicely, you know. All right, but okay. I thought you know there's this rivalry, and as the Wheel of Time writer, mm-hmm. I leaned into it, and I you know would make the occasional good kind joke. I would okay. jibe at him, right? Mm-hmm. Like when they did the um, the the cage matches. You don't, I don't know if you remember that, but no. this was a thing that uh, Random House was doing on their website, their tour.com, um, where they'd be like, who would win, this or this? And then they would put it to a vote, and then they would have oh, the uh, a writer, the staff mm-hmm. writer, write how the fight played out between you know various fantasy people. Yeah. And um, – They'd also asked the writers involved if they wanted to be involved. And I actually wrote a couple when they came to me. And I wrote an ending to their big battle royale for them. Okay. Uh, or if it was on my website, it was with them as a conjunction. I knew the, the people who were running that, nice mm-hmm. people. Uh, and in that, for instance, I, I had Richard show up he, you know, the, 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 to the battle royale, realize it was a fantasy battle royale, and poof away. Because he can't be in a fantasy uh, story, right? Stuff like that. Yeah. After I wrote that, 
Goodkind had his agent, Russ Galen, call me on the phone. <laughs> like, legit call yeah. me on the phone and be like, Terry's really mad. And can, like, why are you treating Terry so poorly? Can't we have professional respect? I'm like, dude, Terry hates the fantasy genre. He's insulted all of us. It's good natured. I'm not out there saying, you know, yeah. go rough the guy up. I'm saying, oh, his characters aren't in fantasy books. Poof, they go away. Mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. And I'm like, come on, Richard, yeah. Russ, Russ Galen. I'm like, come on. He's like, yeah, look, he's my friend. He's a colleague. Can you just cool it? It really bothers him. And I realized some of the stories I'd heard about Good Kind made me think that there might be psychological things that this was legitimately upsetting. Mm -hmm. So I said, yes, yeah. I will cool it. It sounds like it's just not something psychologically that he's, he's uh, prepared to that deal he's, with. You know, and we're at the same publisher. I'll cool it. Fine. Um, but to this day, I'm just am amazed that on these like lighthearted mm -hmm. ribbings that I gave that he got real upset. He got real upset. There was apparently he sent some of his fans after me too, and there was like a whole thing no. and whatnot. And so there's there's your good kind story. Okay, Here, Wait, we're, this we're, is gonna be a long one because I got I got two more things. Two more things. I got two more things. Show us two more things, and then I have another uh, yeah, can, author can, I want to mention. Look, or this you, is, is that a binder? Binder, card binder. Oh, for very all my nice. cards. Universes Beyond is that like their label for all the yeah licensed properties? All the licensed doing? properties. Okay. So. And this you one, need to make a cube, yeah, that has all like Lord of the Rings and Warhammer and Doctor Who. Do and, I have to? Like, I wanted just Lord of the Rings cube. Well, that'd be fine, but yeah. I want a Universes Beyond cube too. That would be fun because then you can fight all these people yeah. against each other. That's, That's pretty nice. Here we'll show that to the. It's just a green binder. There you go. And deck boxes. That That's says a deck box. Yeah, a wooden deck box that says "Speak, friend, and enter." Holy crap! Yeah. Okay, this is really good. This looks like a broken token kind of board game thing. Yep, you can put two two decks and in it. It has magnets to close it up. Mm. I don't know why I'm shilling this box that is just stuff that I don't even get. It's a get. cool box. It's a cool box, though. I am jealous. All right, tell me another, our last author. All right, so the last author I want to talk about, mm -hmm. absolutely foundational for me, uh, Lloyd Alexander. Okay. Yeah. Um, Welsh writer who did uh, primarily known for the Prydain Chronicles, but he did a lot of other stuff as well, uh, like the Kestrel and, and that whole series. Um, one of the first fantasy authors after Tolkien to get uh, movie adaptations. Uh -huh. There was a really bad Disney cartoon of the Black Cauldron, uh, which Tim Burton worked on and held a seance so he could ask Walt Disney how he would adapt the black cauldron um yeah it was is kind of a mess i still love it just because i love lloyd alexander um i love the the practicality of him you know taking uh you know starting and it, it's very common to fantasy right to have the little farm boy who becomes a king and in this case it's an assistant pig keeper um the fifth book in that series called taran wanderer if I were to make a list of like the top five greatest fantasy books ever, Terran Wanderer would be on that list. That one, that one changed who I am as a person. I've never read any of them. You've never read them? Nope. Oh my gosh. Missed them somehow. Brandon, I thought we were friends. And then by the time I'm like, I'm in my 20s, I've seen Black Cauldron. I don't know <laughs> if I'm going <laughs> to ever read. Oh and I, he gosh. actually came. never read. Have you read any Lloyd Alexander at all? Never read a single thing. He came to BYU, did a book signing. A, a lot of my friends went, but I'm like, ah, I haven't read any. Okay. Um, so, you know who came to uh, BYU? Uh, my wife was a teacher, mm -hmm. and I was a fantasy writer. Like, okay. That, that's a cent That's practically the degree I got because yeah. I wrote a fantasy novel as my like senior right. honors thesis. Mm -hmm. And so when she graduated. Madeline Langle came and spoke, and I was like, no, she's supposed to be for me. And then when I graduated a year later, uh, I was some dude who wrote a book about teaching. He wrote a book called The End of Education, uh, and so we got each other's commencement speakers. I didn't go to commencement. Well, that's all right. <laughs> I went to UVU's <laughs> commencement this year. That's my first one. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, we're going to play. We're going to end okay. with you having to pick. I've got, I've got three cards here. 
Okay. And I'm going to, they're all really cool designs. I'm going to see what you think. Last March of the Ents. Last March of the Ents. Yes. Okay. Sorcery. Sorcery. Yep. Um, Boy, the, 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 the Last March of the Ents is when they destroy Isengard. Yep. Uh, so I kind of want to say that this is a thing that uh, turns a bunch of your forests into creatures and makes them big and scary. And then you can go attack your opponent with them. That's a really good guess. Uh, it's where I would have gone. It's slightly different than that. You draw cards equal to the tough, greatest toughness among creatures you control, then put any number of creatures onto the battlefield. Oh, okay. So it's a, um, it's a, a make a giant army. Thing. Make a big old army. Yep. I was going to say destroying land, but that's not really a green no. ability. No. And so, so, all right. Okay. Saruman the White Hand. Saruman the White Hand. Yes. Uh, at this point, he is Saruman the Many Colored, and so I would like to say that he's five colors, but I doubt he is. Mm, he's not. Yeah. See? Because even though he wears many colors, he is a three-color card. He's a three-color card. Saruman yeah. is going to be uh, red and white and black. Close. Red, blue, and black. Red, blue. Okay, blue. Blue for wizardry. I'll absolutely things. see that. Yeah. I, he's the white wizard, so I said white, but blue yeah. is a better fit for him. Yep. Blue is the color of knowledge and, and yep. deception and all these things. Okay, what does Saruman um, what do? What does Saruman do? Uh, I think he raises giant armies. He whether does? they be orcs or uh, the Dunlandings, he raises armies and sends them out to attack people. It's whenever you cast a spell, it makes an army the size, the size of, of the, the spell. spell. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And then he also gives goblins and orcs wards so they're harder to kill. Okay, so. I dig it. And if I told you yet what Gandalf does, because Gandalf is one of my favorites. Gandalf does a thing. Gandalf, there's Gandalf three Gandalfs. Gandalf this, is, this is Gandalf. This is like the Gandalf the Grey. That's the Gandalf, uh, yeah. This is like they Fellowship have, of the Ring Gandalf? Yeah, they've got a Gandalf friend of the Shire, which okay. is a kooky old man who goes to the Shire. They've uh -huh. got a Gandalf, you know, of the Fellowship, basically Gandalf mm -hmm. the Grey, and then they've got a Gandalf the White. Gandalf the Grey. Gandalf the Grey. Yeah. So what does he do? Hmm. He, oh boy, he's got to have a fire ability, right? Because that's most of what he does. He leads people, he inspires people, he lights things on fire. Mm -hmm. Um, Boy, there's no way Gandalf is a red card, though. Well. Maybe he is. He does light things on fire all the time. He so actually is, he is blue red. Blue red. I yep. can see that for Gandalf. So what Red does he is do? the... Um, 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 uh, is the color of passion in magic. And since you've gotten mm -hmm. out of it, they've leaned into art and, and emotion. So oh, if they okay. have a card that's like, you know, uh, you know, uh, joyous uh, congratulation, it's a red card. That makes so sense. They've, they've given uh, that. Extreme emotions feels yeah. very red. Mm -hmm. Okay, so blue and red, those are the colors of instants and sorceries. It is. And so uh, I think this is going to be another thing similar to Saruman. When you cast a spell, it triggers some effect where he either lights something on fire or he pulls characters out of your deck because he is one who gathers teams. So he has four abilities oh my that word. you can choose among. My gracious. One of them is he lights things on fire. There's so much text on these cards. One of them, you can tap or untap a permanent. Okay. One of them is you copy a spell. And the fourth one is the best. You can only choose each one once. Okay. And oh, like in the course of the game. Yeah, yeah. When the, that card, you have to choose a new one each time. Okay. And the fourth one puts him on top of your library because he leaves. Because he leaves. He runs off. But He's then like, he, you guys are good to go. Here we go. But then he comes back because you draw him the next you turn. you can recast all the spells. You can recast him, the, and then the you can do all again? four of them again. Okay, so, that's really clever. Isn't that smart? That's great. Like Gandalf the Grey is just always kind of gone. It's like, yeah. hang out. I'll be back. Uh, and that's what he does. And then you draw him John again and you him. cast him. Third day, look to the east. Yep. And it's a, it's a cool card also because it's whenever you cast an instant or sorcery. Mm -hmm. So you can protect him by keeping like a lightning bolt in hand. They go to kill him. You kill something and, and Gal's like, and off I go. Bounce him into your deck. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. That's cool. So they, we, we may do this game a little bit Done. more. I love these uh, Lord of the Rings cards. So there we are. <laughs> there, there's my, there's my, um, you know, my shilling. We we can do this. We don't have we we don't have sponsors. Yeah. We we don't we don't you know come and tell people that they should play Raid Shadow Legends or uh, have a, a VPN or things like that. Mm -hmm. Our sponsor is me signing these things. So once in a while we can we can have Brandon nerd out about free stuff he got sent. I think right. Yeah, I think so. Cool. Well, there you go.
How's that, Ben? Thank you.